Hey everyone, how you doing? Welcome to another exciting adventure here on Silver Oak Online. We take a look at one of the greatest turning points in the history of mankind. That's right, the Industrial Revolution. So we're gonna take a look at, you know, how did people go from living on small farms, these rural, rural areas, to within a period of about 100 years, right, moving into large cities and working in factories. So how does it go from this rural to the urban in a relatively small amount of time? Um, so we'll be taking a look at first, you know, the key inventions that led to this industrial revolution. And then with that, we'll take a look at how it changed the way people work and live. So we'll look at their working and living conditions. Uh, follow along on your worksheet as well as we go through these, uh, these notes. First, we got to take you back to the way things were, and the way things were. Well, well, you know, people worked in their homes a lot of times. They weren't on the farms; they worked in their homes. Uh, this is a picture of a typical uh, family uh, with a spinning wheel, and uh, this was a, a something that they can do in their spare time or during the winter months when uh, agriculture wasn't necessary or possible. And the thing about this particular system, that's known as now as the cottage industry or the putting out system is that people had some control over what they produced. They owned the instrument, the spinning wheel in this case. Uh, it was in their homes, and they could work when they wanted to, at their own schedule. Uh, there was no bell, there was no whistle, there was nothing else uh, like that to demand their time. Now, they were hired for some jobs, and they did have deadlines, but they sort of controlled you know, when they were going to work and how they were going to work. But this will all change over time. Uh, and it's British, it's the British textile industry that's really going to feel the changes of the Industrial Revolution first, and then other industries will follow. So traditionally, you know, you had hand and animal power used to do work. Animal power, I get, you know, of course, is going to be out in the fields during the, you know, the agricultural aspect of life. But inside, you had like this man here working on a hand loom. Uh, you had hand power, even foot power as well to do the job. Okay, and as time progressed, people started inventing machines that would make this labor faster, quicker, easier, more efficient, so they could make more of a profit. So this is one of those first hand-powered machines invented by John Kay called the Flying Shuttle. And this would double the work of a weaver. So, pretty good step in the right direction. Others would follow. Here is James Hargreaves' spinning jenny, which could spin up to eight times the amount. So, now one person can do the amount that eight person, eight people could do in one day. So very much more efficient and more profits can be made for that person. Um, but you can see from, from this picture here uh, with the spinning jenny that this is a pretty large device. It's not something small and this could have some problems with number one, affording such a piece and number two, putting it somewhere in your home. Uh, so now you might have to rent the space out um, to figure out a way to get this uh, spinning jenny in your possession. So that brings us to Richard Arkwright, who is now known as the father of the factory system. And he was an entrepreneur who saw an opportunity with the changes that were happening. And he also invented a new device that would not use hand labor, but would use instead water. So he creates something known as the water frame, using water power from rapid streams to drive the spinning wheels so you do not need hand power anymore. Okay, with that though, you need a lot of space in order to put these water frames in. And there was also another catch to it. You needed water. So take a look at this video clip about Richard Arkwright and about these new water mills and how these mills in the water frame, you know, the water frame uh, specifically, how they changed the textile industry and really changed the game forever. I'm standing next to a machine called a water frame. It was created by the famous English inventor Richard Arkwright, this model is from the 1780s, to spin cotton into yarn. Though it looks fairly complex, it really isn't. It runs on water power, just like the carding machine and saw blades we saw earlier. 
the cotton in the top spools is drawn out by the action of the machine, which twists it nice and tight, and then gathers the yarn onto these bottom spools. It works just like a hand spinning wheel. 96 of them, actually. So it's little wonder that spinning by machine would eventually make spinning by hand obsolete. In no time, spinning mills began springing up all over England. By the late 1700s, these mills were putting whole villages to work, making yarn inside the new factories or weaving it into cloth in their homes. So as you can tell, just from the size of these water frames to the fact that you need to be near a river, and of course the cost of putting multiple uh, water frames in one building, the average person can no longer afford to do this. And it's only the entrepreneurs who have money who invest in this that are going to be able to open up the first factories. Richard Arkwright is the first one. So this basically takes the textile industry out of people's homes, out of the cottage industry, and into the factory system. A major game changer of how goods are produced. Uh, once this is done, other uh, entrepreneurs are looking for ways to make the water frame more efficient. So they developed one machine, Senegal Crompton's spinning mule, was a better, stronger design and more efficient than the water frame. Here you see an early factory with the spinning mules there. Again, you needed lots of space and lots of workers to power such factories. Eventually, uh, probably one of the most efficient tools of the Industrial Revolution in the textile industry will be created, and this is Edwin Cartwright's power loom. Again, water-powered machine that is really going to speed up weaving to whole nother levels. Uh, take a look at this video clip again that shows you the impact of the power loom. Yarn from the spinning machines was spooled onto bobbins. And in the beginning, that's all the textile mills produced, yarn. But by the 1820s, inventors had finally figured out how to make machines that could take all those spools of yarn and weave them into cloth. This power loom is weaving a plain piece of fabric. All the things I had to do on the hand loom are now being performed by this machine, only a whole lot faster. In fact, the wooden shuttle I threw by hand whips its thread back and forth so quickly, we have to slow down the action for you to see it. These looms could be very dangerous. If a shuttle like this should break free, it could pierce your flesh like a bullet. If you got your sleeve caught, it could cost you an arm. But when the power loom was perfected, weaving, like yarn spinning before it, would move from the home to the mill. Many newer mills became huge, as owners sought greater profits by bringing carding, spinning, and weaving all under the same roof. So what was the impact of these new machines, these water frames, these new factories, and these power looms? Well, again, cloth merchants could boost their profits by speeding up production, but they did need to be run by water power, so they had to be near a river. Machines were large and inexpensive, and only uh, certain people could afford to buy them and house them. And this took the spinning out of the house and into the factory, a major change in the way things are produced. And the progress in the textile industry spurred other technological inventions, as we will soon find out. So, big change here. But the changes would not stop coming. That's right. Soon another major game changer would take place and it would be led by the ideas of this man James Watt who develops the steam engine. Now, he wasn't the very first one to invent it but he's the first one to really perfect it so it could be useful in a factory. 
and later these machines would be used to power other devices, not just uh, factory work. But this would be a de develop a cheap, convenient source of power, and it was based on coal. Coal discovered to burn hotter and longer than wood, and was used to create steam that would be compressed in engines in order to move parts of machinery, such as rotors and levers. And now, you do not need water power anymore. You just could use steam. Game changer, take a look at this and answer the question about why was this such a revolutionary device and how it changed factories. <laughs> This remarkable contraption is an old steam engine. Look at the precise movement of the vertical piston. It's moved up and down by the rise and fall of steam pressure inside the cylinder. And that up and down motion is converted into rotary motion, which operates all the machines. This was a revolutionary device. It made it possible to run machines any time, any place, and in any kind of weather. Over the years, operators used both steam power and water power. But eventually, the steam engine replaced water wheels as the primary source of power for most mills. With steam engines to run machinery, mills no longer had to be located near rivers. And once freed from the river, the stage was set. This was the perfect time to have a revolution in transportation. It starts early on with paved roads by John McAdam, uh, who ends up creating road beds of layered stones for drainage so your horse and buggy wheels wouldn't get caught in mud during times of rain, which of course in England, it rained a lot. But the biggest transportation uh, development would be with a steam engine being used to pull a locomotive. This is now known as the train, the railroad. George Stevenson's rocket in 1829 would really change the game forever. You see, now railroads can spur more industrial growth by giving manufacturers and entrepreneurs a cheaper way of transporting their goods from one place to another. And not just their finished products, but materials needed to make their own products, especially coal. Taking the coal from the coal mines, bringing it to the cities where the factories are. This railroad boom created hundreds of thousands of new jobs for railroad workers and miners as well. But the biggest impact was going to be felt in travel. Not just with goods, but with people. For the first time, people can now go places much faster, much quicker. In fact, people even started taking vacations. Look at this chart from 1836 with the horse and buggy to the changes by 1850 with the locomotive. I mean, just from London to Edinburgh, you go from 43 hour journey on a horse and buggy to 12 and a quarter hours, right, by a train. Huge difference in time. And it made things a lot easier to do. And eventually it's going to lead to another invention because they wanted to improve upon the railroad. And that would be the Bessemer process, which uh, consists of the smelting of coal and iron to make steel. And so the steel with the steam engine, those two things together will really be the foundation for an even bigger, better industrial revolution that really leads us to where we are today in the industrial, I'm sorry, in the, in the information age, the computer age that we're in right now. But this is the foundation for it all. It's really the steel and the steam engine. With that being said, um, we will stop here and get more into the conditions of the working and living conditions of the people next time. Um, so stay tuned for that. Take care.